Welcome to A Moment of Zen. Time to sit back and relax as model, actress, mentor, and supermom Zen Sams takes you on a sexy and wild ride covering the latest in film, fashion, pop culture, cryptocurrency, fintech, cannabis, and entertainment from the millennial mom's perspective. Here's your host, Zen Sams. Hello, my beautiful tri-state area. Welcome to our 170th episode. It's always such a pleasure to spend my time with you on the airwaves. Thank you so much for listening to me and interacting with me on social media. It truly makes this all worthwhile. Please make sure to follow me at Zen Sams. That's Zen with an X, not a Z. And also remember that all episodes of A Moment of Zen stream 24-7 on your home TV and Kathy Ireland worldwide. You can always find us directly on our YouTube channel at Zen Sams. In our Going Deep segment brought to you by CO2 Lift, we're headed to Skin Solutions Collective right here in New York City. Today, we'll be chatting with Derm Duo themselves, Laura and Diana Palmisino. Today, we'll get their thoughts on CO2 Lift for skin rejuvenation. Plus, we'll even get to check in with a few of their patients to get the reactions to how this amazing product aided their pre and post care routines. In the Discover Your Potential segment brought to you by Smart Pet Talk, we're joined by contributor podcaster Dan Gilman, and today he's joined by Sir Alex Stern, an iconic figure in the entrepreneurial world, regarded as America's startup success expert. They join me today to chat all about driving innovation, growing businesses, and seeking success. In the Hydration with Heart segment brought to you by Once Upon a Coconut, In collaboration with Charlie Rocket's Dream Machine Foundation, we're featuring dreamer Carrigan Nelson, currently using music and her singing voice to raise money for her terminal bone cancer. In our FinTech TV exclusive segment, Vince Molinari, CEO of FinTech TV, sits down with Kevin O'Leary, the shark himself, chairman of O'Leary Ventures, to discuss the current state of TikTok. In a law recently passed by Congress, TikTok will be forced to sell by January 19th of 2025. O'Leary joins Vince to deliver the breaking news that he's interested in buying TikTok through an initiative involving potential advertisers on the platform. Stay tuned for Carrigan Nelson for Once Upon a Coconut, chatting bone cancer, music, and staying positive. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York iHeartRadio. We'll be right back after this. A Moment of Zen is brought to you by Once Upon a Coconut, 100% pure coconut water. Imagine a drink that's nutrient-rich, powerfully refreshing, naturally sweet with no added sugars, not from concentrate, zero additives, low in calories, absolutely no artificial flavors, and is so tasty that it will become your new favorite beverage. Enter Once Upon a Coconut, the absolute best-tasting coconut water you will ever try. Available in four refreshing flavors, pure, chocolate, pineapple, and sparkling with energy. Do your taste buds a favor and pick up some today at onceuponacoconut.com. Welcome back, beautiful tri-state area. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York iHeartRadio. I'm your host, Zen Sams. Up next in the Hydration with Heart segment brought to you by Once Upon a Coconut in collaboration with Charlie Rocket's Dream Machine Foundation. Today, we're joined by 23-year-old Carrigan Nelson, diagnosed with osteosarcoma, which is an aggressive pediatric bone cancer just after her 18th birthday. She's endured five long years of intense chemotherapy and multiple surgeries. Relapsing for the fifth time, she's considered incurable and chemo resistant with her rare disease, taking one of her legs, part of her diaphragm and metastasizing to both lungs. But one thing it hasn't taken is her spirit. She's not only a five-time cancer warrior, but she's also a pediatric cancer advocate and award-winning vocalist. She uses her voice to spread awareness, lobby for more pediatric funding, and raise money for community causes. She remains so committed to her advocacy work throughout her never-ending battle for her own life, all the while singing at every opportunity she can get. She joins me today to share her cancer journey, prognosis, and how she continues to advocate, spread awareness, and inspire others. Welcoming now to the show is Carrigan Nelson. Welcome, superstar. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so honored to be here. I am so excited to chat with you. So thank you so much for joining me today. Now, before we dive too deep, 
Um, and before you answer my first question, I'm going to educate our listeners just a little bit. For those of you that don't know, according to the American Cancer Society, osteosarcoma is a rare bone cancer in which the cancer cells look like early forms of bone cells that normally help make new bone tissue. But in this case, the bone tissue is not as strong as that in normal bones. There are about 1,000 new cases diagnosed each year in the United States, and most occur within children teens and young adults between the ages of 10 and 30, with teens being the most commonly affected age group. About 2% of childhood cancers are osteosarcomas, and they make up even smaller percentage of adult cancers. Now, let's go back to the beginning, Kerrigan. You were diagnosed just after your 18th birthday. You're now 23. Can you tell us a little bit about what led you to this initial diagnosis? Where were you experiencing experiencing symptoms and how did you react to the diagnosis? Yes. So right after my 18th birthday is when I got diagnosed. But before that, I did Taekwondo and I also did dance. I was very active. I traveled a lot. I was a dog walker. And about six months prior to my diagnosis, I started to get very pale, very tired. Before singing performances or Taekwondo or dance, I had to take naps. I was, I honestly was constantly napping all the time. And I took a little break from dance and Taekwondo. And when I went back, I noticed that my left leg was really hurting. And I thought, am I out of shape? I'm like, I didn't take that much of a long break. And, you know, I kept going. I kept trying to power through it. But each day, the leg pain was getting worse and worse. So I ended up going to the hospital and the doctors. And it kept getting misdiagnosed as a sports injury, which is very common with osteosarcoma, unfortunately. And... I ended up going to the mall with my friends one day and I remember we had parked on the other side of the mall and then all of a sudden like I felt I felt down where my left leg was below my knee and there was this giant swollen area and I pressed on it and it felt really deep down and I called my mom and I said mom there's there's something there's something wrong it's it's not a sports injury it's it's nothing like that I I feel like if we don't pursue this and go to the hospital that you're going to lose me because I honestly was so sick and I was pale. I couldn't keep up with everything. I was missing school. It was a lot. So I ended up going to the ER. Actually, before I ended up going to the ER, I couldn't walk back to my car. When I went to the ER, they did an x-ray. Nothing showed on the x-ray because my tumor was actually hiding behind a bone. And it was the size of a softball but it was hiding behind the bone, which was crazy. So they ended up doing a CT scan and that's when it showed that it was a cancerous tumor. We didn't know if it was, wow. yes. Didn't know if it was Ewing's um, sarcoma or osteosarcoma at the time, but ended up being osteo. And the crazy part is the tumor had completely eaten away at my bone to the point where it was so thin and right about to break. So I was walking on a bone that was probably days away from breaking. Now, my dear, you are, so strong. I am so sorry to hear all of this, but I'm glad that you're with us right now telling this story. Uh, And I know that you advocate heavily for knowing the signs and symptoms of osteosarcoma, which is so important because that's how most of them are caught. Now, the most common symptom uh, is what what you just said is pain at the site of the tumor in the bone and the most common sites for these tumors in younger people are around the knee or in the upper arm, but they do have the ability to develop in any bone. And of course, any other common symptoms I'm going to uh, assume include swelling or limb pain. Can you talk to me more about um, what else you were feeling at the time? Yes. I honestly just didn't feel like myself. I didn't feel like Kerrigan. I'm very bubbly and silly. And I just remember feeling depressed. And when I looked in the mirror, I just, I had this. So I was actually babysitting at the time. And the mom of the children who I was babysitting kept asking if I was okay. And I said, yes, I'm okay. My lips were kind of this weird, like bluish color. And I remember my mom was talking to the mother of the kids that I babysit. And she's like, I'm worried about Kerrigan something just seems off. She's been limping while she's been babysitting. And we kept on being told it was a sports injury. And there was also swelling in the site. Um, It was where my calf was. So it was hard to tell if it was muscle or not, but it ended up growing more and more. And the pain 
ended up getting more severe and throbbing. And I overall just didn't feel well in the middle of the night. I would wake up in pain and I would have to flip to the other side of my leg. And I just, I really didn't know what was going on. I had never heard of osteosarcoma before. And that's kind of what led to the diagnosis was I had to trust my instinct and really listen to my body. And I right. just, something was wrong. So let's talk about the prognosis. So prognosis depends on many factors like your age, tumor location, and when it's detected. And in your case, although it was detected five years ago, it has metastasized to your lungs and has essentially been, been deemed incurable. And I can't even begin to imagine being faced with the weight of that news, but I do know you remain hopeful and will soon be entering a very intense CAR T cell immunotherapy clinical trial in North Carolina. Could you describe this treatment process and tell us a little bit about this trial? Yes, of course. It in actually a couple days I'm go, couple days I'm going to get my cells harvested and I believe they just they can do it kind of like when you're giving blood it's going to be a similar scenario to that. And then I get to go home for about 4 to 6 weeks and during that time my cells are going to be re-engineered to attack the cells to attack my cancer cells in my body and hopefully kill the cancer and for those four to six weeks i'll be waiting and then i'll get the call they're going to put on they're going to put me on a chemotherapy which will then lower my lymphocytes and my ability to fight off infection so it will be a little scary but that's okay i've been neutropenic before <laughs> And then I will get the cells and then hopefully we should know in the next couple of months if it's working or That's so. That's incredible. And we're going to be cheering you along in your fight. And I have great faith in this trial. And also a big shout out to Charlie Rocket from the Dream Machine Foundation. He's a great friend of the show and our sponsor, Once Upon a Coconut, uh, works closely with him. I know him and his team have been helping raise funds for this trial and all the logistics that come with it. So everyone definitely has to head to Dream Machine to donate to Carrigan's fundraiser there. Now, I know you all, you have some amazing vocal abilities, which you use to raise funds for your treatment and other causes close to you. How fitting that we are airing you right here on iHeartRadio. When did you first start singing? And I know in 2021, you performed the national anthem at a Boston Red Sox game, which is amazing. So I'd love to hear about that experience. Yes. Honestly, singing the national anthem was such an honor. And it's a song that, of course, you want to do justice. And I was very anxious for it. But that had been something that I wanted to do ever since I was younger. I've been singing probably about since the age of four is when my parents noticed that I could match pitch to other songs that were on the radio. And then when I was about 12 is when I started singing publicly at restaurants. And then my mom also worked in low income housing. So I'd sing at a lot of fundraisers to help the homeless. And then down the road, I ended up fundraising for pediatric cancer before I even knew that I had pediatric cancer, which is so weird to think about that I was already kind of diving a little bit deep into the world and didn't know that I would once be in that world one day. But I've just been singing forever and I sing every single day and it's very therapeutic for me. And since the cancer has metastasized to my lungs, I feel like it's really good for my lungs just to keep inflating and to keep them very healthy. And I'm just, I still feel so lucky that I'm able to keep doing what makes me happy. Well, it's incredible that you're using such a natural talent to fuel yourself and others. Now, I also think it's important to note that according to the Children's Cancer Foundation, until recently, only 4% of the federal cancer research budget was allocated to pediatric cancer. More recent evaluations have identified that percentage to be closer to 8%. There's still a desperate need for increased funding. So you, my dear, are a passionate advocate for pediatric cancer funding. And I love that about you. It's not just about you now. It's about you and everyone else. So besides sharing your story online and singing to your community, I know you've lobbied twice in DC for more funding and have sat on several pediatric cancer nonprofit boards. As someone actively fighting such a disease, I'd love to hear your opinions on the matter and how you have seen firsthand the lack of funding affect your community. Yes. I, I mean, honestly, it's very devastating that 
the lack of funding is something that we even have to deal with, honestly. I have lost a lot of friends that are very close to me, and I've seen a lot of families affected by losing one of their loved ones. And I don't think cancer should be that political. When I was lobbying, there was a lot of the blame game where it was on one side, they were like, well, there's not enough funding because of this party. And then the other party would say there's not enough funding because of this party when they really should have been working together. Because at the end of the day, we are losing precious lives and every kid deserves a future. Everyone deserves a future. I deserve a future. And it's just really unfortunate that we're in this scenario where we're not getting enough funding. I'm grateful that in 2025, we will be getting 8% of funding because that's, because as, as you just said, it used to be 4%, but we still need so much more. Yeah. Well, there you have it. I mean, you're 100% correct though. Cancer in children and adolescents is more rare. It's still the leading cause of death, right? By disease yeah. after infancy among children in the U S and that's according to the national cancer Institute. So it's definitely important to ensure proper funding. So people like you are not overlooked and receive proper treatment. Now let's switch gears and chat about your personal support system. I know you have many wonderful people surrounding you, a whole online community and now Charlie and the dream machine team. How important do you think it is for cancer patients to have a support system? And were there any specific moments or people that particularly inspired or supported you during your treatment? I think having a support system is one of the most important things during a cancer journey. I live on a small island in Rhode Island, and the whole entire community has been so incredibly good to my family and I, whether that's donations, prayers, if I'm in a grocery store, someone will come up to me, give me a hug, say, I know you're sorry. I'm here for you if you need anything. Um, cards in the mail and just flowers, edible arrangements, everything like that. It goes such a long way because you never, personally, I've never felt alone in my journey. I've had some very low points, but between my family and friends and community, they have always lifted me up. And I have an amazing friend friend group. We all have matching tattoos. It's like a flower bouquet and it's wrapped with a ribbon. And I'm the sunflower because the symbol for osteosarcoma is a sunflower. And they always listen to me and they do not judge me. And they're here for me. And we always say that staying silly is so important. And my parents just had never left my side, never spent a night alone in the hospital without one of my parents. And my dad drives me back and forth to all my appointments, and he's incredible. My mom has MS, so now she is out of work, and that means that she's just been able to help take care of me and go to the hospital with me. And one person that I would like to mention is Katie Histing. Actually, Charlie, what, Charlie was in contact with Katie before Charlie was in contact with me and Katie's so cool. She has her, she has her own sticker shop. She's fighting Ewing sarcoma and she just perseveres through everything. No matter what she has gone through, she's kept up with her sticker business. She travels to all the national parks. And what I think is so cool about Katie is when Charlie visited her, her dream was to get her sticker shop out there, but she also sh shared my dream with Charlie, which is getting my voice out into the world and raising more awareness for osteosarcoma, which I think really says a lot about her and is is very selfless because she could have kept this dream to herself and, and not have told Charlie, but she ended up telling Charlie and then Charlie is when he came to my house and that was incredible. And I'm so thankful for that experience. I will, I will never forget it. And Aww, you experience I'm here today. Love all around, big shout out to Katie. Now, your spirit um, and tenacity are extremely, extremely unique. I'm sure the past five years have had quite their fills of ups and downs. Now, how have you managed to stay positive and motivated throughout all of this? And looking back five years ago, is there anything you wish you had known or any piece of advice you could give yourself at the beginning of this journey? If I was to look back on my journey, I remember being in that hospital room, being told, that I have cancer and I I knew osteosarcoma once I did the research because as soon as they told me of course I was on my phone I saw the sorry the statistics I saw how aggressive it was and I was petrified for my life 
And I just wish I could go back and say, it's going to be okay. You're going to fight like heck. You're going to have an awesome community that's going to get you through this. And I wish I could have told myself that throughout your whole entire journey, you've never let cancer define who you are as a person. It's been a part of your journey, but it's not who you are. And you've stayed true to yourself. And one of the things that I have done is I've done a lot of crafts. I've done a lot of singing. I try to sing at a local restaurant called Locals in Tiverton, Rhode Island. Every two weeks, they've been incredible to me and they've been fundraising for me as well. And it's an outlet for me to just go and be myself. And even though that I've lost my leg and I look differently, I'm I'm still Kerrigan and singing is just my one of my biggest passions. So singing crafts, hanging out with my dogs, going swimming, hanging out with my friends, being silly. And making a lot of noise so you can beat this disease. We are at the end, my dear, but I just want to tell you how you touched my heart, uh, your story. We are going to continue to spread it. We're going to continue to fundraise for you, and we're going to try to make sure that you beat this. We beat this together. Thank you so much. That was the beautiful Carrigan Nelson, a 23-year-old five-time cancer warrior, pediatric cancer advocate, and award-winning vocalist. You definitely need to follow her and her story. Check her out on the gram at Carrigan M. Nelson, and be sure to donate to her fight at dreammachineusa.org. Her upcoming clinical trial could be truly life-changing, and you could make the difference. That was our Hydration with Heart segment brought to you by Once Upon a Coconut. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York iHeartRadio. We'll be right back after this. A Moment of Zen is brought to you by Once Upon a Coconut, 100% pure coconut water. Imagine a drink that's nutrient-rich, powerfully refreshing, naturally sweet with no added sugars, not from concentrate, zero additives, low in calories, absolutely no artificial flavors, and is so tasty that it will become your new favorite beverage. Enter Once Upon a Coconut, the absolute best-tasting coconut water you will ever try. Available in four refreshing flavors, pure, chocolate, pineapple, and sparkling with energy. Do your taste buds a favor and pick up some today at onceuponacoconut.com. A Moment Moment of Zen is brought to you by CO2 Lift. As we age, our skin loses moisture and elasticity, causing wrinkled skin. You can reverse this aging process with CO2 Lift. CO2 Lift utilizes the powerful benefits of carbon dioxide to lift, tighten, and regenerate your skin. This simple, painless at home carboxy therapy treatment is scientifically proven to reverse the aging process. You will see reduction in wrinkles, increase in luminosity, and improve pigmentation, sagging, skin tone, and radiance. For more information or to order CO2 Lift, go to CO2 Lift. In today's Going Deep segment brought to you by CO2 Lift, we're headed to Skin Solutions Collective right here in New York City. And today we'll be chatting with the Derm duo themselves, Laura and Diana Palmisino. For 20 years, twin sisters Laura and Diana have been two of New York City's most sought after cosmetic dermatology experts. As co-founders of Skin Solutions Collective, they have offices in both Tribeca and Greenwich, Connecticut. Today, we'll get their thoughts on CO2 lift for skin rejuvenation. Plus, we'll even get to check in with a few of their patients to get their reactions to how this amazing product aided their pre- and post-care routines. Let's go check out what the hype is all about. Follow me to Skin Solutions Collective. Welcome back, beautiful tri-state area. This is Zen Sams, your favorite iHeartRadio host. And today we're all the way right here in Tribeca at Skin Solution Collective with Diana and Laura Palmisano. Welcome, girls. Hi, thank you. So we're at this incredible location, one of two locations to my understanding. You have another location in Connecticut. We do in Greenwich, Greenwich, Connecticut. Connecticut. Do you say everything at the same time? I mean, we're twins. We're twins. (laughs) I love this. Yes. Okay, so let's get right to it. Right. What made you want to break into this industry and, and open up such an incredible practice right here in the hustle and bustle of New York City? I sometimes feel that it found us. Yeah, I think I really honestly that dermatology was something that affected me as a child with acne and suffering mm-hmm. and, and just I felt it just kind of found me. And then as us going through school and cosmetics and lasers, it just it came to us. I felt New York City came to us. It was always part of our being, this location yes. and being here. So you're no, they're known as the Derm Duo, which I think is so unique. You must service quite an amount of women that fit your demographic, that want to look like you, that want to 
that want to be just like you and have incredible skin because up close and personal, these girls do have beautiful skin. And we're going to get to the heart of what makes them so gorgeous. Now, let's retract just a little bit. So we're here today and we're chatting about a product called CO2 Lift, carbon dioxide therapy for skin rejuvenation that's been around since the 1930s, to my understanding, although the method of delivery has dramatically changed since then. And now we no longer have to inject it. It's applied for, via a mask, 45 minutes mm -hmm. cutaneously, right? So can you tell me more about this trend, carboxy therapy? why women are Google searching this all of a sudden, number three Google search in Q3 of 2023. So just remember that, right? Women are, want to know what this product does. How did you first hear about it? So our philosophy for the last 20 years has been about refining, rebuilding, and restoring the skin. So we use the latest technologies and treatments to get the best results for our patients. And we first heard of the CO2 lift through its founder, Lana Kerr, and even before um, its launch. We knew she was extremely dedicated to skincare innovation and the industry. Right, right. Skin, skin rejuvenation is really at the heart of it all. When you have a product that increases hydration in a single use by 117% and it's clinically verified and clinically researched, the science doesn't lie. So who are your prime patients that you would recommend using CO2 Lift for? Yeah, so for our germ duo patients, it's... Not necessarily, you know, if it's more when is okay. the appropriate use yes. and when will be of most benefit to them. Right. And exactly. And we don't always, we ask, you know, questions too, you know, what's the skin health of the patient? Do they have photo damage? Do they have inflammatory skin conditions like eczema or rosacea, mm -hmm. um, photo damaged skin? What's going on with their skin health? Right. Yes. So what's the primary use case for CO2 lift in your practice? So there's many uses that we can do with this right. because it's really about overall skin integrity That's right. and how we can use it to basically improve it. Right. So when looking at a patient, looking at their treatment, we're determining, you know, when's the appropriate time to use CO2 lift for its properties, this carboxy therapy property to enhance skin health and, uh, you know, enhance the hydration factors. Mm -hmm. So the, the prime candidates for this product are pretty much everybody. Yes. Everybody yes. is a candidate. Yes. And how fast do you see results? So actually, we can see improvement instantaneously yes. to reduce fine lines, wrinkles because of the intense hydration that the CO2 lift offers. Yeah, so again, you know, we've really seen firsthand how this carboxy therapy is so effective in its use. And because of it, we actually even encourage it as maintenance, you know, yeah. monthly, even after our treatments. And for our Derm Duo patients, it's really about, you know, they want comfort and quick recovery after procedures. And when you apply the mask, what's the immediate reaction that your patients report feeling? So immediately it, it's cooling, mm -hmm. it's soothing, it, it feels luxurious. Just, yeah, it is. It, it is. feels it's luxurious. It's just luxurious. Yes. It's, and, you know, even and the smell, you know, it has this unbelievable welcoming smell to it. it. It's, it's just so inviting. It's inviting. It's a bougie treatment. It is. When you talk about use cases, now I know, I know you're very... Um, you're, you promote combo therapies yeah. and it's actually a trend now. No one is just resorting to a single, you know, therapy. It's more about combining therapies and catering them to individual patients and really understanding what patients need from the, you know, hydrating the skin from within. What's the number one procedure people are requesting these days? Okay. So actually the Fraxel Dual is a great example. It's intense yes. because of its deep penetration. It could treat anything from like pigmentation, fine lines, scars. So it requires a solid like seven to 14 days of healing time. Yeah. And this is not a comfortable seven days. It's not like the first day you're very warm, almost like sunburn. And then the day after and the day after that, you feel this redness, you have swelling. And, you know, with, with the use of it, even after, and the, again, before the right. laser, we've seen improvements up to two days of reduction in healing time with it. And when a patient uses a CO2 lift mask 24 hours prior to like a Fraxel appointment, mm -hmm. they actually can see reduction in the inflammation that they would receive post-treatment because it helps with the skin integrity and resilience. So the overall treatment is just more comfortable. Right. So then also using it 24 hours after, say, the Fraxel laser, and then every other day thereafter, you can see even more of an improvement. Again, bringing it those days down in that healing process. Yes. Again, look, we've seen up to two days. So the CO2 lift just makes the treatment 
easier because of that intense hydration. And I've heard it's really effective for hyperpigmentation, for acne scars, for any kind of discoloration. Um, and, and, and now they're really clinically researching and verifying it for more medically complex treatments like lichen sclerosis and diabetic ulcers uh, and pre and post major surgery for open wounds, right? Liposculpture. I heard, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but somebody, one of your fellows compared this to a hyperbaric oxygen chamber. Yes. What do you say to that? So it really is this magical healing topical component. It really is a wound healer because really our skin is an organ. It's a barrier. We're trying to really mm -hmm. improve. And again, going back to that word integrity, we are trying to maintain the integrity of the skin, which is the barrier. So it's a protective agent and it increases the circulation of the red blood cells. Mm -hmm. Okay. It actually detoxifies because it, it, it allows the, the circulation eliminating things and then it helps the blood flow. So of course it's going to increase the wound yeah, healing. Get time. that oxygen there. We yeah. want the oxygen to get to the point that we want it to get to. Yeah. And they were using it post venous ligation yes. to help improve the healing time. Okay. Well now we're going to put it to good use and we are going to see in real time what your patients Derm Duo patients are going to be experiencing. I know we have uh, some some difference in generations. We have somebody in their 30s and somebody in their 50s that are going to be trying the CO2 lift mask uh, pre and post. We're going to get the reactions in real time. Let's do it. Welcome back, my friends. We're here with Sophia Pavlakis. She's one of the patients here at Derm Duo in Tribeca, and she just had a treatment done to her face and then had the CO2 lift mask in combo therapy. Welcome to the show, my friend. Thank you so much for having me. So happy to be here. You look stunning and glowing. You too. Tell Thank me you. what procedure you just had done. So I recently had full thermage and Fraxel treatment, and I actually incorporated the CO2 lift mask both before and after the treatment this time, as opposed to what I've done in the past. And so I did it 24 hours before I came into the office, before I came to Derm Duo, and then I did it 24 hours post-treatment, and then every other day following. Now, you're in your 30s, but you look like you're in your 20s. Thank your you. skin is fantastic. What concerns do you have, skin-wise, that you are treating it with the Fraxel? So Fraxel, which is why I really came into the Derm Duo first, was to treat my acne scarring and hyperpigmentation that I was um, experiencing. So that's why the twins recommended the Fraxel treatment for me. And when you applied the CO2 lift mask after your treatment, what did you immediately notice? Okay, immediately, my the time that I typically see in recovery after the Fraxel treatment, it's long, but by using the CO2 lift mask, overall recovery was cut down, I would say, by two days. That's dramatic. When you have a total recovery period of four and that cuts it down to 50%, that's considerable. Is this a, a mask that you're going to consider using after this treatment? Oh, without question. The CO2 lift mask will definitely be a part of my pre and post treatment regimen moving forward. Are there any limitations to using CO2 lift to your understanding? No, actually the opposite. I think anytime you put it on, your skin is left feeling so hydrated, glowing, and it's just so cooling, calm, refreshing. It's amazing. Well, you're doing something right. Take her advice. Get the treatment pre and post Fraxel treatments. You're amazing. Thank Congratulations you so on looking fabulous. But of course, when you come to the Derm Duo, that's what happens. You come out looking fabulous. Cynthia Irons, welcome to the show, Superstar. Hi, thank you for having me. Oh, this is brave of you. You're bearing it all. I mean, it's not brave. It's rejuvenation. She's glowing, by the way. So <laughs> what procedure did you just have done? I recently had Sculptra and Skin Deep, which are both biostimulatory injections. She knows her stuff. Got and it. It's your face. It's your face. And did you use the CO2 lift treatment pre and post? I used it post-treatment immediately after, and then I also used it at home to help with the recovery process. And what's the main result you noticed? I was really impressed with how much the inflammation subsided right after getting it and how much my bruising went away faster than it ever has. This is the third time I've had Sculpture and Skin Thief at the same time over the course of the last six months. And prior to doing it, I didn't use the CO2 mask immediately after, and this time I did. And the results were dramatically different. When you say dramatically different, what did you notice visibly different the second time while using the CO2 lift product? Immediately 
from leaving the office, I wasn't as swollen as I've been in the past. And the bruising that I typically have was not as bad and it didn't last for as many days as it usually does, which when you're recovering, you want that recovery to be as minimal as possible. You do, you do. And well, you look fantastic. Now this is, um, this product CO2 Lift, how was it introduced to you? Derm Duo, Laura and Diana, I've been seeing them for years and they brought it to my attention and they said it would really help me when it came to how comfortable different procedures would be and how much I would recover faster. And those are my two favorite words. Well, Laura and Diana know their stuff and yes. they look fabulous themselves. Um, when you took the mask off, was this a treatment that you thought to yourself, I want to do this again? 100%. It's really interesting how comforting and cooling and how refreshing the mask feels right after you've had a treatment because I mean your face has gone through a lot and you want it to be comfortable and it really helps with that but then it's also interesting at just how easy it comes off it's not like a mask that tugs at your face so when it goes on it feels really light and comfortable and it comes off really easily well you look beautiful and glowing I'm sold you wow. are fantastic and thank you so much for coming on today thank you for your testimonial thank you and it's all the germ duo that was our going deep segment brought to you by co2 lift thank you so much to cynthia and sophia for sharing their co2 lift experiences with us and definitely be sure to visit the derm duo laura and diana palmicino at one of their offices you can check them out online at dermduo.com or on the gram at derm duo you're listening to a moment of zen right here on 710 wor the voice of new york iheart radio we'll be right back after this a moment of zen is brought to you by your home tv with kathy ireland and their channel partners head to yourhometv.com for free family-friendly programming streaming 24 7 the Kelly Williams Show is brought to you by Serendipity Yacht Cruises and Events. Tune in and turn on your happy. Kelly Williams is full of energy and incredible guests. Watch her anytime, free programming on your home TV network, and do follow her on social media for a chance to win monthly prizes. Check out The Kelly Williams Show on yourhometv.com. Tune in to A Moment of Zen, Saturday nights from 9 to 10 p.m. on 710 WOR, the voice of New York. Welcome back, beautiful tri-state area. You're listening to a moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York iHeartRadio. I'm your host, Zen Sams. Up next in the Discover Your Potential segment brought to you by Smart Pet Talk. Today, we're joined by our regular contributor, podcaster, and co-host, Dan Gilman. And today, he is joined by Sir Alex Stern, an iconic figure in the entrepreneurial world. With his pioneering spirit, He's best known as a founding team member of the renowned company Constant Contact, which he has been with for over 18 years, from startup to IPO to a $1.1 billion acquisition. Regarded as America's startup success expert, he's been a co-founder or founding team member of eight startups with five incredible exits, two IPOs, and three acquisitions. His insights have guided countless startups from the ground up, helping to shape the landscape of modern entrepreneurship. They join me today to chat all about driving innovation, growing businesses, and seeking success. Welcoming now to the show is Dan Gilman and Sir Alex Stern. Welcome, superstars. Welcome, Zen. Welcome. Thank you. So excited to have you on. Okay, let's dive right in. Sir Alex, yes, you heard that right. Sir Alec, because I know you recently received the distinct honor being knighted and ennobled as a Baron of Boston of Cappadocia by the Royal Order of Constantine the Great and St. Helen of the Royal and Sovereign House of Cappadocia and St. Bartholomew for your exceptional accomplishments in entrepreneurship. I can't believe I actually did that right without fumbling any of that, uh, specifically in entrepreneurship's innovation and philanthropy. So I think it goes without saying that you are quite the expert, but I'm curious to know throughout your illustrious career, what has been one of the most unconventional pieces of advice that you followed and how did it pay off? Yeah, so um, I think that the biggest thing for me is the, uh, the management and handling of obstacles. Uh, you know, uh, I was always that person that would take a piece of paper and put a little box and then write on a line, you know, the obstacle and hope I checked the box by the end of the day, but it, it never went away. And over time, it just felt like the font got bigger and bigger and bigger and the, that obstacle weighed on me more. But I actually learned that, you know, I'm not the first one to uh, sort of struggle with that obstacle. I won't be the last. Um, those that have succeeded at knocking it down, there are some that have failed. 
So just to really seek counsel, go find others and talk through that and maybe break it up into smaller pieces so you can have some wins in knocking down the obstacle. And it's kind of creating a muscle memory because behind that obstacle is a bigger one. And then behind that next one is a bigger one. And you have to figure out how to do that. And oftentimes when people drop out of the, the startup game or want to sort of quit, it's because it's an obstacle or something that weighs on them. And for me, I had a, that was a, something I learned and I appreciated the advice I got on how to handle that. Well, all that advice and hard work certainly did pay off. I also admire how you continue to pay it forward. I know that after you settled in Boston, you became very involved in the city's nonprofit ecosystem, and you've done everything from co-chairing galas and fundraising to co-founding two nonprofits of your own, raising millions of dollars in the process. So it should really come as no surprise that you were presented with the Be Greats Exemplary Humanitarian Award in 2022. You are truly doing it all. Now, I know Dan has a few questions as well, so I'm going to hand it off to you, my dear. Can you tell us about a time when you had to pivot dramatically in your career or business strategy? And also, what drove that change and what was the outcome? Yeah, so uh, pivoting is a natural, it's, it's just a natural thing in the process of in a startup. Um, you know, you, you set out to do something. And if you were kind of thinking about the analogy of a lane of a highway, you know, you have your idea and you're on that lane. And then sometimes, you know, you find that, that the, uh, you know, the opportunity exists in the lane adjacent on either side of that. Or sometimes you, you're on the wrong highway. You got to get on another highway and find another lane. And so I have a lot of experience in, in doing that. And I think the, the learnings for me is, um, is just really getting out and asking your target market. You know, I get asked every single day, many times, what do you think of our idea? What do you think of my idea? And my answer is, it doesn't matter what I think. What does your target market think? And I think we sort of forget, even though we might have been that target market at one point, like, I'm, you know, I was a small business, so I know what they need. Things change, you know, up to the minute. And so for just getting out, and then going in and seeking, you know, sort of uh, uh, the advice and, and hearing, the, you know, and learn from that target market. For me, that was the thing that got me realizing that, okay, maybe we've got to shift lanes and maybe we got to switch, you know, everything from messaging to, to, to what we're saying and to even what we're offering. Uh, and so there's always pivots and, and things happening in, in any business and they will continue to happen. And, and, and that, that's change and change leads to opportunity uh, providing you're you're going in the the lane in the direction of what your target market wants. Yeah, I love that. I love the analogy of the highway. That really resonated mm. with me. Um, now, I know innovation is key in any business. In fact, according to a McKinsey survey, eighty four percent of executives believe innovation is the key to growth, and companies that promote innovation are three and a half more times likely to outperform their competitors statistically. Now, can you share an instance where a simple idea turned into a major game changer for one of your startups? Yeah, so, so uh, I mean, the, the, the bigger one that most people know is Constant Contact. Um, you know, the, uh, there, were, there was a lot of innovation that, that, that happened. And, and um, you know, we were really set out initially to see you know, how do we level the playing field for small businesses on Main Street with those big competitors? You know, at the time, Amazon and others had enterprise level tools, which cost a lot of money. They had staff, they had, you know, uh, consultants, they had agencies, they had everyone sort of helping them in that process. But the average small business, you know, didn't have any of that. And so what could we do to create a self-service, easy to use tool? And the, initially uh, email marketing being the, the sort of the first offering in digital marketing, which is what we would call it today. And, and then um, to just, you know, give them something. All they had to worry about was what they were going to uh, say, when they were going to say it and who they were going to say it to. And then all the other stuff under the covers was taken care of. They didn't have to know technology or anything. They would just create the message and we would create that beautiful looking, you know, campaign for them that that would look just as good as you would find from those bigger competitors, the big box competitors. So, so um, you know, innovation just, you know, uh, from the get go. And we were one of the first software as a service ever, ever. Like, you know, everyone talks about SaaS and cloud and, you know, rented software and so on. But we were one of the first ones that uh, ever to launch. So there was a lot of innovation and and things like that, you know, helped, you know, pave, pave the way for us to be able to scale effectively and also pave the way for, for so many companies today to be able to create 
you know, easily create something and get it out and get it into market and, and be able to, to, to give it to customers without the, the requirement to install anything or, you know, it's sort of up in the cloud and easy to access. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that's incredible. So uh, building a strong team is crucial, as we know. What qualities do you look for in people when you're forming a new team and why? Yeah, so I, I literally was just having a conversation before this interview about this exact topic. You know, for me personally, the big the bigger things is um, uh, uh, you got to leave your egos at the door, right? So there's no room for that. Um, be title agnostic. So it doesn't matter, you know, someone's like, well, I want the chief of, you know, product or the chief of revenue or, you know, titles don't matter. Like we're all going to be wearing a lot of hats and doing a lot of things, um, you know, and then and then some would say, well, you know, I really want to report to you. You know, it's like, well, I might not be in this position or be here. Yeah, you know, I might move on and or move up or aside or whatever. It's whatever's best for the business. So someone will come in above you, next to you or below you. And you got to be open to accepting this. And there's a lot of people that that really are really worried, caught up and worried about the title. If I could have the perfect title, it would be E-I-E-I-O. You know, and, <laughs> and if that could fit on a business card, you know, I'll go ahead and get that printed. But it doesn't matter because you're staying in your lane and you're going to do what you're good at and you're going to bring other people that are going to stay in their lane and do what they're good at. And you don't need a lot of people doing, you know, that are coming in with the same skill set. You know, you see some companies, the beginning three founders have the same skill set, but you have to establish like, Who's going to be outward facing and talking to customers and investors, you know, CEO, who's going to be internal and kind of overseeing the running of the business, the COO, who's going to be developing the products and services, you know, the CTO, you, you know, those are sort of roughly what those titles could look like, but it doesn't matter. It's really just what's your skill set and you stay in the lane and, you know, you have a better uh, opportunity to, to, you know, succeed by doing what you're good at than trying to do a bunch of other things, taking a land grab and grabbing uh, uh, stuff that others you know, could do better. And so I couldn't uh, agree think, more. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. And I love how you place such an emphasis on building a strong team because it really does have the ability to make or break a company. Um, and according to Zipia research, about 75% of employees rate teamwork and collaboration as big essential to overall success. And to go even further, a study by Fierce Inc. found that 86% of employees cited ineffective communication or a lack of collaboration as the main source of workplace failures. So you're absolutely right to be seeking out these qualities to form the best team possible. Now, you also clearly have a knack for seeing potential in the early stages of a business. But what are some red flags you watch out for when mentoring or investing in new ventures? Yeah, so I think one of the, the, one of the big things is passion, right? You, know, um, you need to be passionate about your idea. But if we had a passion meter, if you're pinning the, the needle all the way over to the you know, little bit too passionate, sometimes you get in your own way and and you'll go down with the ship like, you know, just, it, you know, kind of this conviction that I know what this I, the, the idea and I know what it needs and I'm going to make it happen. And uh, so, so so you got to be open to you know feedback. You got to be open to listening to others. You've got to, you know, again, talk to and listen to your target market, you know, and really hear hear what they're saying. And I've seen some, you know, that just. They're just they they know they know the answer and and we don't you know even though we might have been that target market for many many years as I said it changes daily and so so I think that the kind of a red flag is sometimes if it's a, they're a little too like I want someone who's excited about the idea but I also want someone who's going to be able to um, like no matter what happens if the problem hits they don't want to quit and go home they're going to you know work all night and get the team to rally around solving a problem. And then be like, hey, we, we, we solved it, you know, over the weekend or, or we solved it, you know, uh, last night. And that, that, that they just they're, they're just so uh, believe in the idea so much that they'll do anything to make sure it's successful. And 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 oftentimes that, you know, folks that have that you know passion and conviction, you know, are the ones you'd want to fund any any day versus mm -hmm. someone who, who's, you know, when, it's, when the, the going gets rough, they quit. Yeah. Yeah, that's um, what is the biggest risk you've taken in your career and, and how did that shape your approach to business and leadership? Uh, so I, I am. It, it's funny. It's funny. Uh, I am a risk taker and unfortunately I take uh, too many risks on too many things, you know, like an international flight arriving at the airport 20 minutes before. You know, you don't want to do things like that. But but I've had <laughs> agents say to me, are you a risk taker? I'm like every day. 
but as far as it, you know, within, within business, you know, you've got to, you know, you got to take a chance. And I think, you know, in my own statistics, you know, 85% of the time a product or idea or, or a service that someone's going to bring to market is just executing on something that already exists, but could be done better. And there's a lot of industries that are asleep at the wheel that, you know, that you could execute and do better. And then there, of course, the 15% is creating something that didn't exist before. You know, when we see so many examples of that, Airbnb and Uber and, you know, Google and Facebook and all these things that have sort of come come along the way. Constant Contact was an example of one as well. Um, and so, you know, just, you know, again, taking that risk is to, you know, can you call yourself an innovator? You know, and, and we're all we're all entrepreneurs if we have an idea, but we're an innovator if we take action. And so that's just, you know, running it by others, you know, noodle on it, get other people to support what you're doing find that target market, get their feedback and then, and run with it. And so I've taken a lot of risks, but believing, you know, you know, uh, uh, you hear a lot of no's over time and I ignore those because, uh, and no means not now in my world, you know, you can always cultivate those and turn them into yeses later and get feedback and so on, but just get out, take that idea, take that risk, you know, and, and if your target market says it's, uh, something they want and they're willing to pay for it, you're onto something. Nice. We are almost out of time. We have two questions left. So shifting back to the topic of innovation and looking at the technological advancements today, whether it's artificial intelligence or cybersecurity, e-commerce, the metaverse, I mean, the list goes on and on. But which industries do you believe are going to hold the most promise for young entrepreneurs to explore? Yeah, so, so it's a question of whether it's something that they want to build a business around or it's something that they want to use that innovation to help advance their, their business, right? And I think there's, a, there's sort of both sides of the, the coin that, that where this exists. I've been very active in AI. I've been very active in the metaverse and been very active as new things are coming out uh, to really learn about them and see where the opportunities lie. And I think, you know, um, the, the, there's so many, uh, I guess, efficiencies and things that, that can come into play with a lot of the new technologies and, and some are not new. They're just, just advancements from the way they were before like AI and it's been around for a long time, but now it's just advanced in so many ways. And, and to take advantage of using that, um, not to displace or change, you know, the, the creative nature of, you know, uh, um, marketing messaging and all these things. So, you know, drop it into AI and let them give you the answer, but, but to truly use it in some of the efficiency areas like customer support or, or you know, folks on on the phone, you know, fielding questions from from customers, FAQs, et cetera. There's a lot of areas where that can can help, and and I believe that 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 also means there's a lot of opportunity. So I'm really blown away with what's out there and and what's to come. You know, with some of these some of the the advent of some of these these areas now, like AI, and of course, uh, spending time in the metaverse and uh, and so on. I know we're we're almost out of time, but um, for our listeners who dream of starting their own business. Could you share one piece of practical advice to help them on their journey? Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I said it said about feedback's a gift. So that's just important to do that at every level, especially as you're getting going. You know, seek counsel from mentors and others that have been in your industry or, or circling kind of something that you're thinking of doing. You get a lot of, a lot of great advice and uh, from 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 others that have been been there and done it before. And of course, you know, uh, from that target market. And I think the big one that is said, you know, a no means not now, you know, that's the, that's the biggest thing for me. I would hear a no and I would ask for feedback why they said no. And oftentimes you get a no because it's what you said, how you said it and when you said it. They weren't ready to receive it or you didn't say it as, as well as you should. You know, the elevator pitch, you know, of explaining your business. You know, some people will assume that the elevator rides 20, 20, 30 floors. It's not, it's one or two. Can you succinctly say what you're doing in a very short amount of time? But the key thing is starting with listening and you got to be silent and listening. If you take the word listen and you move the letters around and spell silent. So to be silent and intently listening to whoever you're talking to, they'll get the cues of what they want to hear and then play back to them, you know, what your idea is and how it might benefit them. Okay. That is incredible information, very transparent, very, very well put together. I love your analogies. I love your metaphors. You are not just a great speaker and a great entrepreneur, but you are cut out for exactly the work you do. Thank you so much for coming on and for sharing your insights with us. It was truly invaluable. Thank you so much.
That was the Discover Your Potential segment brought to you by Smart Pet Talk. And that was the incredible Sir Alec Stern, entrepreneur, startup mentor, keynote speaker, and investor. Definitely be sure to check him out online at alecspeaks.com. It's Alec with a C, not an X. And on the gram at Alec Speaks to stay up to date with his latest ventures. And of course, you can see more of Dan by heading to Discover Your Potential Show. Dot com. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York, iHeartRadio. We'll be right back after this. A Moment of Zen is sponsored by Fintech TV. Fintech TV, the newest streaming channel focused exclusively on the business of blockchain, digital assets, and sustainability. Broadcasting from our studio on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange with daily reports from NASDAQ, global expansion, and 24-7 coverage. Become part of the launch. Head to fintech.tv slash invest. Fintech.tv slash invest. Tune in to A Moment of Zen, Saturday nights from 9 to 10 p.m. on 710 WOR, the voice of New York. As the digital asset ecosystem continues to grow, so do the questions surrounding regulation and crypto as a long-term investment. Joining us to discuss it all is Kevin O'Leary, chairman at O'Leary Ventures. Kevin, great to have you back. Great to be here. Thank you. Well, listen, let's break right in here. TikTok news from you yesterday. Share with us if you could. As you know, uh, in the most remarkable outcome of con congressional law, a law was passed that has basically given TikTok till January 19th to sell. Uh, the concerns about uh, foreign adversaries, spyware, a lot of people don't use TikTok for those concerns, and finally Congress brought it to the point to where the Indians got to five years ago. They banned it in India, so we don't know what's going to happen, but because one of the options for the company is to be able to sell it, it's a domestic ownership. Um, I want to buy it. And so one of the options I thought would be very interesting is so many of my companies are entrepreneurial and use TikTok to advertise. In fact, over six million companies do that. That's where the majority of the revenue comes from. I want to ask them, would you be interested in becoming equity shareholders with me down the road if the deal ever happens? So I don't know. There's no terms. The company's litigating Congress, which I find an extraordinary outcome. So we have no idea what, what this will be, but because it's such a short time frame, I'd like to get organized by asking people, are you interested? And fortunately, um, there is law that allows me to do that in equity crowdfunding. I'm proud that you know, in the Jobs Act, they had the vision to democratize ownership. And this is what I'm doing. And so I've asked anybody that's interested to go to wondertiktok.com. Wondertiktok.com. Exactly. There it is. There it is. And register your interest tell me if you're interested and to what extent you're interested and how much you would invest if you could I have no idea what the terms are yet and I disclose all that but I think there's going to be a lot of interest in this because it's such a controversial situation and I have no idea the outcome and nor does anybody else but this is the one thing I do know I believe it will require the pen of the executive who's ever the president of the United States to get this deal done we've never had a case like this ever Absolutely love it. So much to cover, but I have to applaud you on the creativity, the use of the Jobs Act, solving for a national issue at the same time, and really democratizing wealth creation and returning the power of social media to the individuals who are participating. I think it should be that way, particularly for TikTok. You know, I want to make TikTok wonderful again. <laughs> <laughs> you heard that first here on FinTech TV. A Moment of Zen is brought to you by Your Home TV with Kathy Ireland and their channel partners. Head to yourhometv.com for free, family-friendly programming, streaming 24-7. Do you have the dream of starting and owning your own business or know of someone who does? If so, check out Your Home Business Program, where they inspire, equip, and encourage those who dream of owning and operating their own business. Check out Your Home Business on yourhometv.com. Tune in to A Moment of Zen, Saturday nights from 9 to 10 p.m. on 710 WOR, the voice of New York. Well, that's a wrap, my dear friends. Remember to join me right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York, every Saturday night from 9 to 10 p.m. Or you could head to 710wor.iheart.com forward slash A Moment of Zen. Also remember that we're live on Traverse TV Sundays at 1 p.m., YouTube Sundays at 2 p.m., and all episodes of A Moment of Zen are available on Your Home TV and Kathy Ireland worldwide streaming platform that's free programming to you. You could head directly to our channel at mox.yourhometv.com. 
Thank you for listening to us. It's been an absolute pleasure being your host. Thanks again to all of our sponsors that continue to make this show possible. And remember that happiness is the only thing that multiplies when you share it.